This is the Too Tall Sports Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. My guest today is Cameron Lowe. He is a former Major League Baseball player, played for nine years in the big leagues. He's got a new business called Halo Health, and it's all about using microcurrent technology to help uh, athletes and even people that are you know, in physical therapy and getting over injuries and recovering and, and having a, a healthy lifestyle without the pain management that they used to. It's a really cool technology, so we dive into that. Uh, we also talk about the fact that he took over as the president of the Association of Professional Ballplayers of America, APBPA, and he's revamping it. It's all about current and former major league and minor league players and helping ball players transition to regular life and all that stuff and what uh, the organization is now going to be doing for, for players. So really cool stuff. And he's got some great stories about his career. So we talk all about uh, Cameron's career and he's an LA guy originally. So we do, we talk about that as well, but uh, a lot of fun with Cameron Lowe uh, today on the episode. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. Check me out there. I'm doing a lot of content on TikTok if you guys are on there for you youngins. So check that out. Uh, just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. As always, you can follow the episode or watch the interviews on YouTube, on, our, on my YouTube channel, Two Tall Sports Podcast. If you could subscribe, rate, review, leave a comment, like, share it, all that stuff, it would really help us out. On the audio side, every Thursday and as long as along with YouTube, Every Thursday, we release episodes on Apple and Spotify and everywhere else, Pandora, Amazon Music. If you can on, on Apple and Spotify, there is a place to do ratings. So hit the five-star rating if you could. That would be a lot of help to get uh, the show more exposure. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. So you can find that subscribe button on both. I believe on Spotify, it's either a follow button. So you can do that as well. So you can get notified every time there's an episode, like I mentioned, Thursday morning, early Pacific time, sometimes 4 a.m. when I release them. So but you can check that out there. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast and you can find the show. And uh, that'll do it for my intro here. We'll get to the interview, uh, with a very fun one with Cameron Love. All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a former Major League Baseball player for parts of nine seasons. He's originally from L.A. and played his college baseball at Cal State Northridge. Uh, he was drafted twice, once in 1999 and the other time by the Texas Rangers in 2002. He's also part owner of Halo, which specializes in healing and recovery using microcurrent technology, which we will get to. And he's also the president of the Association of Professional Ballplayers of America. And we will cover all of that with Cameron Lowe. What's going on, Cam? What's up, Red? How you doing, man? Thanks Good, for man. Up. Yeah, gl great to have you. Glad we got connected the other day. And uh, excited to talk about your career as a baseball player, but also all the more cool and fun stuff you're doing now. So definitely glad to have you on. Uh, and yeah. by the way, you fit really well on this podcast, being 6'8". You know, it's called the Two Tall Sports Podcast. So you know what that tall life is like. Yeah, brother. It's hard <laughs> to find pants. But you can, see, you can see really well at a concert. That's true too, right? Nobody blocks your view. Yeah, exactly. And I it does help. I the guy's concert one time. I, I went to a tool concert and I was in the third row. And after the concert, I saw the guy in the parking lot. He and his buddy were about five, three, I think. And they were like, oh, there's the guy that ruined the concert for us. I was like, sorry, man. What are you supposed to do, you know? Get a ladder or something. Out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, were a lot of people when you were growing up were, were put, trying to push you into basketball? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I played basketball in park leagues and stuff like that. And, sure. Uh, once I got into high school, though, all I wanted to do was play baseball. I, I told my mom, I said, all I'm playing is baseball. We put, you know, Southern Cal League, play, play all year round. And sure. So as soon as the high school season's done, you know, you start an American League or travel ball or whatever it is. And so, yeah, um, the, the basketball team was kind of kind of mad at me. They, they give me, you know, give me crap all the time. So I was like the tallest in this kid in the school since sure. you know, my you know, ninth grade, and, but just loved baseball, man. I uh, couldn't dribble with my left hand very well. <laughs> yeah. Once you, you know, you start to learn, like I, I can, I can compete or, you know, you, you find out what you're good at basically in high school. So I, I totally understand that. Um, yeah. What kind of, as far as your high school career goes, uh, you went to Granada Hills, which uh, also Ryan Braun went there, who you would meet later on in life with the Brewers. And we'll talk about that. But as far as your high school as a baseball program, was it like a powerhouse? What kind of school was that? We had a good program. We were known for a, you know, a decent program. Granada Hills High School is, um, we're, our rival is Chatsworth High School, and they've been nationally ranked, you know, for yeah. numerous times. I'm um, not sure where they are right now, but when I was playing, you know, and, and a few years after that, they were, they were a definite powerhouse. And right. we always competed with them. And 
Um, I was uh, I was ten and one my my senior year, and they were my one loss. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we were we were a decent school, and Braun and I actually played together. My senior year was his freshman year. Right. Okay. Right. And then you guys played against again together at the Brewers. Yeah. Um, what, could you tell even as a freshman that he was going to be really good? You know, he was, yeah, I, I could tell he was going to be at least a, you know, a good college player. Right. Um, he, he had a dinger his first game up, uh, our shortstop hurt himself and, uh, he got called up to, to varsity, you know, first game of the season and he hit a dinger and he just always had a, you know, he had a presence about him. He had a, you know, just the confidence and, and he always worked really hard, you know? Yeah. Bronny really, really worked you know, outworked a lot of guys and, and in really special ways too. He had, you know, eye warm ups and, and he had little, you know, fast twitch muscle warm ups and, and just, you know, even that, that weird thing that he would always do, like yeah. that had a purpose, even though it looked silly. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he, I didn't know, shoot, I didn't know he was going to be a silver slugger, but right. I thought he'd be a good player. Sure. No, no, definitely. As far as you, when you, as you got older, you said you went 10 and one in your senior year, like obviously you knew you had a, probably a future in college or pro. What were your thoughts about where you could go at the next level? And or were you dead set on college or was there a chance that you might sign for pro ball? Um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with, you know, family and coaches and, and even um, Scott Boris. Uh, I, I got to talk to him and, and he encouraged me to go to college. Uh, and so I basically kind of put it where if I don't get a million dollars, I'm going to college. And, yeah. and I knew I was pricing myself out of the market by doing that. Sure. Um, I wasn't a 94 guy. I was, you know, I was touching 90. But uh, yeah, it was the best thing for me. I was, you know, coming out of high school, I was kind of uh, immature. And, sure. And I, you know, I, and I was tall and skinny. I was uh, 6'7", 185. And, you know, now I'm, now I'm 260. So on the same frame, but you know, 70 pounds lighter. Right. Basically. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I had some filling out to do and, and the mental stuff, the, the, honestly, the mental toughness that my coach Mike Basil gave me was probably, it, it, it really changed things. And I, I can't imagine where I would be in life uh, if I didn't go to college and have those three years of getting socked in the gut. <laughs> right. And maturing. I tell people that all the time. And I agree with you on your number about a million. It, it sounds like a lot, but you're giving up those years of maturity in college and just being an adult and all the, like, you can't get that back. And it's easy. You, I'm sure you've seen in high school draft picks, you can get, you know, spit out pretty quickly in pro ball as a high school pick. So I'm sure I, I would guess you tell people the same. Yeah, it was, it was invaluable. Um, yeah. I do tell people, you know, it's everybody's got their own path, but um, right. I, it was just, it was absolutely the, the right thing for me to go to three years of college. Sure. And some of my best friends in life now are still the guys that, you know, I played in college with um, pro ball, you know, you guys, you guys go everywhere all the time. And uh, unless you're sticking with a big league team for a long period of time, you know, guys are in and out of, in and out of the clubhouse in and out of your life really for, you know, but these guys in college, you know, you're with them for two, three years, uh, sometimes four years. And um, yeah, these guys, I, we're all in fantasy football together still. And yeah, text message thread. So yeah, it's, it's really been a blessing in a lot of ways in my life. Nice. Okay. So you end up going to Cal State Northridge, you know, obviously I play in the big West with Long Beach state. So it's a, it's a great uh, conference, you know, compared to the PAC 12, there's a lot of powerhouse teams in there like Fullerton, uh, UCI has, has be, become a, a powerhouse. What do you remember about playing in the Big West when you were in college? Well, I almost went to Long Beach. I, oh, okay. I, I remember meeting with Snow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, I just remember good good competition. I mean, it's it's tough to beat that competition out there, you know, in Southern Cali um, with the yeah. USC's and the UCLA's that you play. And, um, you know, you play Stanford sometimes. And then, of course, the whole conference, you play Fullerton and Long Beach and um and those type schools and it's I mean it's quality yeah no for sure I, I totally agree with you there um so the 2002 MLB draft comes around the Rangers take you in the 20th round what do you remember about draft day or the whole process where you thought you'd go with was Texas talking to you ahead of the draft sometimes it comes out of nowhere so what do you remember about the draft yeah I don't think we ever talked to Texas um you know we talked to we talked to the Mets and we talked to the Dodgers and we talked to you know, a number of teams. I don't ever remember talking to to Texas, and um, 
I remember I was 20 years old. I got drafted in the 20th round and got $20,000. There you and, go. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to go higher. And I had gone through some, some injuries. And uh, my sophomore year, I was on and off the DL. And um, my, my velocity had dropped a little bit. And I started dropping down, throwing sidearm. And so I was switching stuff up. So I think scouts kind of didn't know what to think about me. Sure. Uh, I had a good junior year. But, you know, I, I, I dropped to the 20th round. And I just... You know, I was a little bit disappointed at first, but then I just looked at my mom and I was like, hey, it'll be a drop in the bucket for what I earned in my career. Let's, you know, I'm not going to negotiate. I'm not going to try to get, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 more. I'm just going to sign and go. Sure. And, um, and so I did. And, you know, uh, just thought I'd just go with that mindset. It definitely worked out for you because you didn't spend much time in the minor leagues at all. So before we get to your, your big league debut and all that stuff, as far as your early years in the minors, what do you remember about your stuff as a pitcher translating to pro ball from college? And you really, you didn't have a problem, obviously, because you didn't spend much time in the minors. You know, I think the sinker played well. Um, I wasn't a huge location guy. Um, you know, in and out, I could kind of split the, you know, the plate with in halves. Um, I wasn't a real corners guy, and I didn't pitch up in the zone very much. Um, so I didn't locate that well, but I could throw strikes, and, and the sinker played well. If I kept it, you know, around the knee, and I would just work from the knee to below with the sinker, sure. um, I got a lot of ground balls, and I'd get swing throughs. And then when it went from metal bats to wood bats, it just worked that much better because, you know, with those metal bats, there's a whole lot bigger sweet spot on those things. And, right. Um, and then when I learned how to make firewood, you know, <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun. For sure. And that's something that people don't really hear about much. But you have to learn how to pitch inside when you get to pro ball because those bats will break. Right. And so you yeah. have to and, and you got you can't let guys get comfortable in there. Otherwise, you're just going to. Yeah, shoot it the other those way guys that want to just lean out over the plate on you and if you don't keep them honest in here they will right exactly um you have a great story about when and why you got called up part of the reason at least not because you weren't deserving but a funny story about when you got called up to the big leagues tell us what happened and the whole story behind it all yeah so uh it was 2004 i went from double a AA to triple a had a good year um ended up with like a low three or something like that as a starter and uh, I was home after the season. I didn't get called up. It was it was going to be my protection year. And um, so I, I was at home just kind of hanging out with family. And uh, I got a call from, um, oh, shoot, who was it? I can't recall exactly who called me now. Um, so I, I should ask my mom. She probably remembers. Someone in the front office called Somebody you. Somebody in the front yeah. office. And they, and they happened to be in Anaheim. They were uh, They were just in Oakland. And uh, they were in Anaheim and they say, you know, how'd you like to come down to the stadium? We'd like to, you know, have you work out with the team. And so, you know, I was, I was super excited. And I, um, I was really surprised because, you know, they had already brought their, their guys up, their September call-ups up. Right. And um, the story is uh, in Oakland, uh, the, se the series before, Doug Brokale and Frankie Francisco got into it with some fans. And uh, Frankie picked up a chair. He was big. You know, he was a big, strong guy. And he, yeah. He threw the chair into the stands to because this fan was like acting like he was craw crawling over the wall, going to come come attack the guys. And um, the guy ducked and, and it hit his, I think it was his wife in the face. And uh, so through all of that, you know, Frankie got suspended and, and it was a whole, it was, you know, it's kind of crazy. But uh, that's how I got my, my shot was, was that. And, Frankie and I are great friends now. So I'm always like, man, thank you. Thank you. For, you know, giving me thank that you. Shot, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Some, just for my listeners, they, they might remember that because that was kind of a big deal for like a little while was him throwing that chair in the stands. But hey, for who knows? It worked out for you. So there you go. Yeah, I didn't. That's awesome. uh, you know, I, was, I always told my mom, I was like, I never wish bad on anybody. I would never want somebody to get hurt for me sure. to get my shot. I just want my shot. I don't know how it's going to come. I just want my shot. So, right. Uh, now, did you feel like even as a 20th rounder, you know, the, the first through three rounders are usually the priority guys. So did you feel like with Texas, because sometimes you can get lost in the shuffle if you're drafted a little bit later. Did you feel like you were one of their like priority guys? No. Okay. So no, I had to earn that for sure. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, I remember when I, I told my mom, I was like, I'm $20,000. I said, that's, they, you know, they wake up in the morning and, you know, urinate $20,000. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I said, I got to make myself undeniable. And, um, you know, I worked really hard in the off season and 
I, I had a I had an okay uh, first short season. Went to Pulaski, Virginia. Okay. And, uh, you know, good old Poo Town. And <laughs> uh, played in the in the Happy League, and that was a you know good experience. And but I had like a mid four. You know, did all right. I had had a yeah. couple of games where I had like six inning shutouts, and then I had a couple of games where I, you know gave it up and um, just kind of getting the feel for it. But then I started reading um, the Mental Game of Baseball by Harvey Dorfman. And that changed my life. I mean, it literally changed my life, not just my baseball, but that mindset. Um, and now it's one of the things I really try to study and really uh, try to pass on to the kids that I coach. And, and I want it to be a main focus of the APBPA as well uh, with our youth outreach. Um, it, just that little tweak of going from a negative thought to a positive thought you know, uh, when you're up on the mountain, I remember very specifically in, in college, I was facing UCLA. I was up, you know, by uh, two runs, had two runners on and a big hitter come up. And I remember thinking, just don't give up a home run here and you'll be all right. And what did I do? Whack, you know, home yeah. run. And after the fact, you know, reading this book, and thinking back on that, I was like, man, if I had thought, okay, you know, fastball down and away, or what's this guy's weakness, or, you know, what do I do well here, or, you know, some kind of positive attack thought as opposed to what's this guy going to do against me means all the difference in the world. And so when I read this book, and it, it really gives great examples of, of, you know, a negative thought creeping in your head um, that is like this. It's like your lizard brain trying to protect you, right? And yeah, you just overcome it by going, No, that's not me. You know, who I am is blah, 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 you know, whatever your attack or whatever your process is. And so that little shift just made all the difference in the world. And so my next year, uh, in, in low A ball, I started out in low A and went to high A, and I had a 1.7 ERA, and I think it was the second lowest ERA in, in the minor leagues. And, um, and so it just that little thing, you know, and then obviously the, my next year was good too. And I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, Rangers were struggling for pitching. Right. Uh, and I think they were bottom of the barrel in, in uh, you know, in the big leagues. And I had a couple of good years and they called me up and uh, got a shot. I think people, I tell this people all the time, once you get to a certain level, everyone's really good. So the mental side of the game becomes huge. And how can you manage failure basically while you're playing? Yeah. So there's, you know, there, there's obviously those upper echelon guys, you know, your Alex Rodriguez and, and uh, you know, maybe your Roy holidays, the, those kind of guys. That, yeah. They're good from right to, you know, they're, they're just good. They're just better. You know, their bodies move better than everybody yes. else's um, for the majority of the field, you know, 70%, 80% of the field, it's the mind that's the separator. You know, everybody works hard everybody's talented and right. everybody's had success, but it's, it really is that, that day to day mental process that I believe is the big separator. For sure. Now you, uh, you mentioned you played in Texas and you were in that bridge period before that organization went to the world series a few years later, but I noticed you played with some big name guys, right? I mean, of course, Josh Hamilton, who was like, you know, a star for a little bit. And Michael Young is like Mr. Texas Ranger. Yeah. Any memories stick out about playing with those two guys or anyone else during that era that kind of, you know, reminds you of, of that team? Um, yeah. I mean, Mikey was, he was, he was awesome to play with. He was, always brought a good attitude you know he was a lead by example guy he wasn't a real big you know vocal guy in the clubhouse wasn't going to fire you up but he just always came with the right attitude always came with good work ethic he always you know he just he was a lead by example and um he had an amazing approach you know at the plate and yeah. uh and then you know hamilton was his story is obviously crazy and yeah. um you know but he was a really nice guy soft-spoken and um you know obviously a, a really a talent like if, you know I, i'm sure everybody just thinks wow what if you know what if he had you know stuck with just playing baseball and didn't get deterred and but uh i mean the guy's forearms were as big as my calves <laughs> and, crazy uh and just yeah just kind of a, a bit of a gentle giant and uh but just had some had some demons that he battled that he battled with 
And uh, but right. he, was, he was a special, special talent. He totally was. I remember like a home run derby when he hit like some, uh, I don't know how many it was, 28 in a row or something crazy like that. It was didn't just, he, didn't he hit like 50 total? Yeah, I think that that year he had a, yeah, it was just, you know, that kind yeah. of talent is, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the mental side of the game is one thing, but he talking about overwhelming ability. He was ridiculous. Yeah. 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 I, I compare him to like physical talent to like Randy Johnson. Okay. Yeah. You know, like you, you just don't get those guys. You don't get a body like that very often. That right. Like that. You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we all know the tough part about sports is our injuries. And you started to have a few early in your career, like elbow and back issues. How did you originally deal with the pain management? And then what ultimately did you discover that helped you turn your career around? Thank you for that alley. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had some real bad injuries in 06, 07, um, 07, I, I had my, I was, it was a cold day in Cleveland and didn't warm up enough. And I, and I popped a disc, I uh, herniated a disc on the left side between L4, L5. And I walked around, you know, crooked as a politician for, for a couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I was, you know, on and off the disabled list. I couldn't stay healthy. Uh, the Rangers ended up actually getting rid of me, or telling me that I could go to negotiate with Japan because they knew how bad my back was. Um, I was able to put together a decent 08 up and down like five times from AAA, and you know, put put together a three as a as a reliever. Um, couldn't start anymore. I just didn't have my back. Couldn't take it. I couldn't do multiple innings like that. And it was tremendous pain, man. I, I was a lot of pain. I had to take a Percocet and Vicodin and, and a handful of, you know, Aleve and Advil. And um, I mean, I was, I'll say, I mean, I was even smoking marijuana just to sleep. Um, sure. Anything that I, I was getting two, three hours of sleep a night because I, I couldn't do anything comfortably. And luckily I had a sinker that still worked at like 86, 87 miles an hour. And I could squeeze my core as hard as I could and just step down the mound and, and all arm it and, and still get some ground balls. But um, it was a real struggle. And I thought my career was probably going to be over. Uh, I came home from Japan. I, I came home early, shut myself down. It was just real. Um, and uh, I, I rehabbed for about three months, went to Mexico um, and uh, put up a good enough numbers in, in that month, one month with Mexico, showed that I still had a sinker. And um, I got a job with the Brewers. And so it's spring training of 2010. I'm with the Brewers and, and my back's just killing me again. And, you know, we're about to start games and I'm just, and my elbow's killing me too. Cause I had, a, I had cortisone shots in it a couple of years before that. And yeah, bothering me. So I, I'm just in bad shape, you know, throwing lower high eighties and where I, when I should be a, you know, low to mid nineties guy. And right. Uh, Ted Lilly actually contacted me. And Ted had worked with this guy with this machine um, rehabbing his shoulder. And he said he got back from his shoulder su surgery super fast from using this magic machine. And he goes, hey, man, this guy's in town. I know you've got a bad back and you struggle with your elbow. And he said he'd give you a free treatment. And I was like, sure, I mean, I'll, thank you. And, you know, I, I went over to the guy's hotel room. And 30, 40 minutes later, he, he hooked me up, hooked me up on my back. And 60% of my, of my sciatic nerve pain was gone. So I had nerve pain running, you know, sciatica running all the way down to my ankle. And that was, you know, that was largely gone. My hips and my lower back were then able to move a little bit easier. And I literally went from like the day before having to bend over on one leg and kind of kick the other leg back. So I wasn't bending my back just to pick up a ball in the outfield to go to being able to, you know, now properly shag a baseball. Um, right. And, and, the, and, the elbow issue was cleared up in 30 minutes too that I had dealt with that I had cortisone shots and had everything under the sun available in a major league clubhouse as well as a Japanese major league clubhouse as well as chiropractors and PTs and naturopaths and I mean I was on a mission to find what was going to work and nothing was working and this thing just uh, we call it intelligent microcurrent and um, it's a two-way modality and it uh it reads your body before it treats you. And the guy that created it created the lie detector test and furthered the EKG, EEG, and EMG technologies. Damn. Uh, he's also credited with our missile guidance chip technologies. So he's a he's an absolute genius when it comes to frequencies. And he created this device that reads your body for electrical frequency um, and then deciphers with AI 
what frequency is going to be proper to either you know stimulate healing in your shoulder or or your knee or your back or you know whether it's a disc or cartilage or you know tendon or ligament or muscle the machine actually has markers in in the computers that tell it what frequency holds you know what what part of the body holds what frequency and that is pretty crazy it is it's next level stuff it's really really awesome um and they've actually been around for like 30 years 40 years um there's testimonials from um joe montana uh uh terry bradshaw jack nicholas um i think i think gary Busey even has a as a testimonial on how it helped him out and but there's it's been used it's been kind of almost like a, a an elite therapy uh, that has not been available in your average doctor's office and part of the reason is because it really stimulates true healing at the at the cellular level with with a few cents of electricity out of the wall as opposed to you know drugging and cutting Right. That's what I was going to ask you about is one of the roadblocks, because you would think if something as magical seemingly as this, why hasn't it caught on mainstream? Right. To your point, the archaic medical field is not ready to accept that yet, right? It's yeah, it's a combination of that. Um, the devices take a decent amount of training. And that's what my brother and I specialize in. We've studied him for uh, well over a decade now. And uh, he was actually lead trainer for the distribution company for about five years. And working alongside doctors, uh, developing protocols and, okay. and training everything from neurosurgeons to the layperson on, on how to use these devices. And uh, so it takes about three, six, five or six hour days of training just to get used to it, just to get comfortable with the machine and know how to place the, the tools and the gels and the, and the frequencies and all that all over the body, whether it's, you know, you're going to treat a headache or, or knee pain or uh, there's different protocols for all of that. And so there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more intricate than, uh, than like say a stim unit or, a, an, right, or an, an ultrasound, ultrasound machine or something like that. Yeah. Where you just, you know, crank it up to 20 and, and right. go for 20 minutes. And right. So yeah, there's just, there's more to it. And uh, <clears throat> so somebody will get trained on the machine. It'll be in a, in a doctor's office or a PT's office, you know, some of them that use it. Uh, and then that person that gets trained, goes and finds another job and now they've got this machine that nobody knows how to use and right so that's <clears throat> that's what my brother and i are, are working on remedying and we want to have these intelligent microcurrent centers all over the u.s and franchising them um, because it really does produce true healing uh it stimulates your body to to detox at a, at a hyper level so much that, um, to give you an example, the old cortisone that was sitting in my elbow, I had been shot like right there twice. Well, what I didn't realize was if I wasn't injured anymore. It was the cortisone that, was, that hadn't come out of my body yet or hadn't been flushed out. And so in 30 minutes, it, it pulled this old cortisone out of my skin, made two zits on my elbow and my elbow never hurt again. And it was a one and done. Um, my velocity went from 90, 89, 90, back up to 94, 95, almost overnight. Uh, wow like 48 hour period and i couldn't believe it so um that detoxification um you know factor of it is just incredible and now we we help people detox from all kinds of stuff we, it'll help <clears throat> it'll help pull heavy metals out um it, it'll help you know pull any toxins out because toxins will block your body from healing and we breathe them in drink them in eat them you know, the toxins are everywhere, you know, you know, we put it on our skin and, you know, there's, and so to get those out and tell your body to extract those at a, at a super high level is, is really, really stimulating for healing. Damn, that's crazy. So even you I know we talked about this pre-show, but like even post-surgery, it helps your recovery quicker, right? Yeah, yeah. much quicker, much quicker. In fact, I am 100% confident that if we started using these devices with these protocols um, on a regular basis in clubhouses, we could take guys from Tommy John surgery instead of 12 to 14 months, they'd be back in seven months. Um, and I know, and I say that because I've, I've helped a guy do that as well as there was a uh, NFL running back named Brandon Oliver. And he, he was the running backup for um, uh, Melvin Gordon with the Chargers. Okay. And he blew off in a preseason game. He blew off his, his Achilles tendon, just ripped right off the heel. 
and wiggled up into his cap. And I remember watching the game actually, um, you know, because I play fantasy and so I'm watching sure. the, you know, watching the preseason. And I watched this kid just pop that thing. I'm like, oh man, his career is probably over, you know. Well, little did I know he was in San Diego and this guy with the machines was in San Diego as well. And um, he uh, was back in four months. He got surgery and he was back running and cutting in four months. And he and they actually did a, a news article on him that he had come back faster than Kobe had from his Achilles tendon tear. And uh, that it was just like record breaking time. And so, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to show, you know, major league baseball and, and, uh, and colleges and, you know, these, these other institutions that we can cut guys, you know, recovery times literally in half to maybe even a third of the time. And that means big bucks to everybody. For sure. Wow. That is pretty, that's very, um, inspiring, I guess, that if you have injuries to write, you know, want to write the ship quicker, it's, that sounds amazing. So the name of your company, I thought was interesting. You did this was, is called Halo, but it's H-A-L-O-E because your last name is Low. So that's kind of cool. You added that in there. Um, how long have you guys been doing what you do? And then like, what's the, what does the future hold? Do you think, I know you want to franchise and whatnot, but what's maybe next for you guys? Yeah. So, um, We've been doing this for about 12 years now. I uh, got introduced to it in 2010. Um, my brother, he had a meniscus tear and, and it helped his meniscus tear. And he went back to playing Olympic volleyball uh, or Team USA practicing with the Olympic team. And, sure. Um, so, yeah, we, we, you know, we've studied these things. We, we train people on how to use them. We sell them. We do the services as well. And we had a store open um, up at a place called High Street here in Phoenix. Uh, and we were open for about a year and a half. Uh, we had built our clientele up to where we had 15, 25 clients a day uh, with almost no marketing, all, all really word of mouth and just doing these specific devices. And our results were so good that, you know, people started to send, you know, so we, we were rocking and rolling with no doctor. We were just doing energy sessions for, for pain relief. Right. We, we were healing, treating, you know, nothing, none of that just energy sessions for pain relief and um, our success rates were just awesome. And but then COVID hit and right. we didn't have a doctor. We were deemed non-essential and we had uh, about a $15,000 a month overhead. <laughs> and yeah, uh, after a few months of, you know, our clientele, which was 45 to 65, a lot of them, um, those, those were the ones that were afraid to come out. And so we just said, look, we got to pack up shop. It was a gut punch. But we started, we kept doing it out of our homes and we are respectively doing it out of our, our home offices right now. And we are uh, transferring into a couple of different spots here in the Scottsdale area. Uh, one place called Pure Benefits um, and then another place, Detox for Life. And um, we're gonna be starting up our, our services again um, that way. And we'd like to have, you know, we're gonna be training other technicians and, and, you know, have them with a machine in several other wellness and, and, you know, uh, health spas. Nice. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. I want to go back to baseball a little bit here. Cause we, we, I did skip over that part. Um, let's go back to the 2011 Brewers team that you're on in Milwaukee. You guys were 96 and 66. You won the division, made it to the NLCS, eventually losing to the future world champion St. Louis Cardinals that year. You guys had a fun team, man. Even Prince Fielder was in his prime. You obviously had Ryan Braun, yourself, and others. Tell us about the memories that you had with that group of that 2011 Brewers team. Uh, it was, I mean, that was a special time in, in my career. It was really, really awesome. Um, you know, it sucked how it ended, obviously. The, those Cardinals were so hot, man. Oh, they, man. Uh, um, and I think, I think we kind of got them on that hot streak, too. Um, there was a game about a month, uh, right very beginning of September, and they were like 10, 12 games out of, of you know, of uh, getting into the playoffs. And we were at their place, and um, not Wainwright, but uh, oh gosh, who was it? Carpenter. Uh, Carpenter and Niger Morgan got into it, and then Niger started <laughs> tweeting afterwards, and he goes, you know, I hope those crying birds. Uh, uh, enjoy watching us in the playoffs, and I was like, no. you know, <laughs> uh, love you, nice. Yeah. He's, he's a good guy, he's my boy. Um, man, he was a great teammate, he really was. Uh, guy played hard, but 
Um, yeah, they, they just caught fire after that. And I think they won like 23 out of the next 26 games or something silly. Yeah. It was really, it was incredible. Um, and then they, you know, stayed on fire and, and they ended up winning it all. Yeah, I know. And they, one of them was against your, your Rangers in the, the 2011 right. World Series. 27, yeah. 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 All your former teammates there, some of them at least. Um, and let, real quick on Prince Fielder, what like a guy at that size to be that good? I know we talked about Josh Hamilton having natural ability. What do you remember about Prince Fielder, at least the hitter or any of that stuff you remember? Yeah, he was he was a special talent too. Um, guy who's you know career got sh- cut short. Uh, he was just thick, man. He's just yeah. Like I'm six eight, not you know pretty decent sized guy, but his fists were like that much bigger than mine. You know, he was just wide, and uh, he you know, delivered a ton of power. Obviously, he hit those big, big, huge moon shots. Uh, his spring, his um, uh, batting practice. And then Ricky Weeks batting practice, like back to back, it was like two of the most impressive batting practices, but completely different because Prince is hitting these huge moonshots and Ricky's hitting these line drives that, you know, that are scraping the top of the wall and, uh, and don't get much more than 15 feet off the ground. Right. And they'll get out. And, but yeah, Prince was a great guy. Always again, you know, a good leader in the clubhouse, always brought a great attitude. Um, huge competitor, just, you know, came to, came to kick your butt every day and uh but had a lot of laughter and loved to love to joke around and um, really enjoyed playing with him nice okay i did want to ask you about some of the places you've played now milwaukee when they have when they're in the playoffs man they get their fan base is pretty damn good from what i can tell on tv of all the places you've played where did you like to play the most you know maybe milwaukee or other places but where did where did you like to play the most uh growing up in la i always loved going to the dodger stadium sure um for a number of reasons, obviously, you know, growing up and, and uh, I was born in 81. My brother was born in 88, two years, they won the world series. Uh, but, you know, Oral Hershiser was a, was a hero of mine and uh, yeah. watching those, you know, eighties teams. And so, you know, first time I went back to Dodger stadium was really special for me. And I think I only pitched there three times. Uh, okay. I didn't give up a run. So I got a zero ERA. At Dodger stadium. Nice. There you um, go. But yeah, there uh, always loved Safeco. Just something about you know right there on the on the wharf on the water and smelling the sea air and it's a beautiful stadium and obviously both of those stadiums are good pitchers parks too. Which right? Is, yeah, is, Seattle, man, that it's it's hard to hit homers there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that heavy air and a big park and um, and then Fenway. Um, I always loved going to Fenway. The nostalgia the you know the history going into the green monster and going and seeing everybody's autographs on the inside of the green monster and um you know in the that whole uh area right around the ballpark is just super cool and the fans are are great and you know everybody's it's a, just a good baseball and sports town sure and, yeah i'd say those three were probably my my three favorite that i was we, i get really excited to go to right okay nice that's awesome uh, as far as what you're doing now, also in conjunction with Halo, is that you're, you've recently become the president of the APBPA, which is the Association of a Professional Baseball, yeah, Professional Ballplayers of America. Sorry, it's a mouthful. No, it's a mouthful, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminds me of, I'm sure you've seen, um, have you seen Dodgeball? Yeah. Where he's like the so the uh, associates of yeah. America. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what appealed to you about this opportunity? How did it all come about for you to become, you know, not only involved, but become the president? Yeah. Um, you know, I had been giving into the organization since my first spring training. Um, a guy named Dick Beveridge was the president for, for many, many years. Um, uh, 25 years, he was the president. And so obviously memorable name, you know, he'd come in and, and uh, just tell the guys, hey, you know, we were ballplayers helping ballplayers since 1924. Um, our, some of our bi- biggest ambassadors back then were Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, and Lou Gehrig. And um, really kind of the faces of, of the association. And so my mom actually found my 2003 first spring training. Um, I got my card. So I still have my, that says I paid my 50 bucks and right. paid my dues. And um, so, you know, I go through my career and, you know, every year would give into it. And um, then when I started up Halo, I got reached out to by uh, one of the people that was involved and they were like, you know, what are you doing here? And, 
uh, they started, I said, you know, send over a couple of guys that are, that are hurting and I'd love to help them and, and work with them and um, had awesome, awesome effects and just guys that were in pain for a long, long time, you know, old injuries, chronic injuries and uh, walking in on a cane and then walking out going, Hey, I don't, I don't need my cane right now. And um, so they asked me to come on the board because um, of the work I was doing. And, um, you know, I gladly accepted that board position. It was an honor. And uh, just, you know, I was giving away free treatments to the guys and, you know, just, you know, it was a really great opportunity for me to, to spread the word about my business and, and let, God, let people know about, you know, the, the healing that can go on without, without the drugs and the surgery. And um, yeah, so one thing led to another and I, I, stayed on, I stayed on the board and they went through some turmoil over the last couple of years. Uh, we had a president that came in and really um, ran the thing into the ground. Um, yeah. And I, I won't go into it too much because, sure. uh, you know, we're, we're so focused on, on all the amazing things that we're doing in the future. But long story short, uh, I moved into this place where it was almost kind of by necessity that I, that I take the, the president's role and, and help build this thing back up. And we, we started with I think we had 800 bucks in in the bank account um so really wow. really bootstrapping it and we worked really hard on bringing um amazing people in i actually just brought oral hershizer back i was gonna ask board. you about that who you have on the board besides you yeah he um he was our last board seat that i needed to to, to fill and i called him up and asked him you know um i got to play under oral he was my my first pitching coach in the big league so i had a good relationship with him and nice uh, which was super cool for me you know being a dodger guy sure um, but uh yeah he he accepted and so now we have this you know amazing team of everybody from um uh ray king manny para um we've got a, a couple of guys that are you know money guys that, that manage like you know hundred millions hundreds of millions of dollars uh with smith barney and, and chase and um we've got uh dr aaron shannon who's um she's she is uh mike shannon's daughter and mike shannon's been with the cardinals for 50 years uh as a, a player a coach a manager and, and now a, wow. uh, a broadcaster and she uh does mental sports performance um and she's a sports psychologist uh, as well as you know does uh, other things um on the on the psychology side and um who am I missing right now? Um, we just have a, we just have an amazing team, man. Uh, sure. And we're we're bringing on a doctor who's going to be our medical advisor, and he's going to help us start putting together, you know, medical plans for these guys. And combination of what Halo does and what he does, it's going to be a really really awesome union um, for the you know the MD side and the natural side to come together and really produce amazing healing results for for these guys that have been in pain for a long time sure and, um, you know i see a lot of these guys online saying you know hey brothers uh, you know on facebook and um you know i've, I've been in pain for so long and it, it, i've turned to the bottle i've turned to you know pills and, and i want to help those guys man that really you know that that i know what they're going through as far as the pain and how daunting that is and turning to other substances to to get over that pain and just get through a day right and you know so that's really on my heart to help those guys and so that's you know one of the things that we're building and uh we're also going to be having um like financial literacy programs uh one of those things you know that should be taught in high school really yeah but isn't and you know that these these young guys uh 20 years old 21 years old they get a bunch of money and they don't know where to put it they don't know how to you know and just showing them giving them some financial literacy understanding how money flows understanding you know maybe the stock market a little bit the housing market a little bit um and where to properly put it so that you can you know so that you don't end up wasting it all frivol frivolously um but setting yourself up for generational wealth right you know, you know that's the that's the shift that i really want to help make for a lot of these guys sure now for people that don't know about the atbpa it's basically is it now more 
former ball players or just current minor league and major league and also former ball players involved as well, right? Yeah. So um, since 1924, literally, I'd say probably 99% of every guy that's played in the minor leagues or the major leagues has been a part of this. Right. While they're playing. Um, you know, everybody's like, yeah, 150 bucks out of my first check. Sure. No problem. Yeah. Take it. You know, if it's helping other people, you know, these guys have no problem um, just, you know, donating. Right. So it, it's, I mean, it's, dude, I got to show you because <laughs> this is one of the coolest parts of this. Um, these are dues cards. And this one's from 1927. And I don't know if it's going to. I see George clearly. H. Yeah. 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 George Herman Ruth. Uh, paid $10 in 1927 and then 28 and 29 and 30. So this basically was the Babe's uh, dues card. Very and, cool. And, uh, here's Jackie Robinson's. And I've got, uh, you know, Satchel Pages. I've got Ted Williams. I've got, you know, it, the, the history that this association has attached to it. It's, it's more than baseball. It's Americana. And, um, and we've been helping people for 98 years. And now we just get an opportunity to expand on that. And right. um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, minor leaguers, major leaguers that are current. And then anybody that, uh, you know, that had played pro ball. And, and we even reach into the, uh, the independent league. Nice. Because so, a lot of those guys yeah. obviously played professionally. Yeah. yeah. So really anybody that played professional baseball in America can be a part of this association. And those are our members. And uh, historically, we've had uh, over 100,000 members. And um, now we're going to have a big youth outreach. And because uh, I really want to, you know, I'm big on, on te teach a man to fish, you know, and you feed him for a lifetime. And, you know, so, the, you know, a lot of these, these older guys who, who do need help and that we, we, we gladly help, um, we would like to help eliminate those needs in the future you know um yeah keep these guys skills so that they don't run into you know the hard times after you know post career and sure and help them transition um you know from baseball to the real world which is tough you know it's it's tough whether you had a short career or or a long you know successful career it's uh it's an identity thing it's you know, it's a camaraderie thing. You're used to being around all your boys all the time and you're right. used to competing and there's that, you know, adrenaline flow that you get that it's really hard to replace anywhere else. Um, so That's yeah, all true. It, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, we're just going to be, you know, a support and resource center for professional baseball players and, and beyond um, into the youth and, um, and, and we want to get involved with the parents too. And sure. You know, yeah. Just trying to trying to do good things through the scope of baseball. That's great, man. Can anyone donate to these causes? Anybody uh, can donate. Yeah. Um, we do have some honorary members that you usually have to have done something, you know, of significance for the association or for baseball in general. Right. Um, so those are, those are given away to very, you know, special people, but um to be a member, you have to have played a, a professional sure. baseball, but now we're going to be creating subscriptions. So um, there's going to be, we're going to be, you know, content creator. We're going to have things like dugout talks with, uh, you know, hopefully Oral Hershiser will be a, a big part of that. Yeah. And, you know, interviewing um, doctors, interviewing, you know, other major league ball players, interviewing sports psychologists and, and get, just getting all different angles of the game. Um as well as uh, teaming up with Sabre, uh, the, the sports writers and the historians, and just going to create a whole bunch of content that'll be really cool for uh, our fans and the youth and, and people that want to subscribe to, uh, you know, to the membership. That's great, man. That's, you guys are doing great things, already starting to make changes, which is awesome, um, you know, all for baseball. So where can everybody find um, the Halo Health stuff online and all everything that you want uh, people to know about? <laughs> Sure. Uh, so Halo Health, uh, you go to H-A-L-O-E health.com. Uh, and um, we have a website up right now that's actually, we are, we're revamping it. So um, anybody that goes there today, you know, to, to check it out, please come back in a couple of weeks and revisit it because there's going to be a whole lot more 
explanation of what the devices are doing and um, testimonials from high level athletes, from world famous doctors. Um, and just, it'll be a lot more content and a lot more explanatory. Um, so uh, yeah, go, go check it out, please. Uh, but come back in a couple of couple <laughs> weeks to, to check out what's new. And then uh, APBPA, uh, you just go to APBPA.org and, uh, you know, you can check out our history, you can donate and, um, you know, check back periodically because we've got some really, really cool stuff that we're going to be rolling out for everyone. That's awesome, man. That's great. And where, and, uh, where can people follow you? I think you're on Twitter, right? For social media? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On Twitter. Um, I'm on Instagram, but I don't really use it much. Yeah. I'm not not a big social media guy. Sure. Uh, but uh, and I, I probably need to be now. <laughs> to help promote the biz, maybe. Yeah. 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 So I'm I'm uh, I've never been a big self promoter, but yeah. Uh, but for you know, I, I'm probably going to be a little more active on social media going forward. Nice. Okay. Well, awesome, man. It's great to have you on. Uh, really cool stuff you're doing. I really appreciate it. And uh, I know I'm sure we'll be talking soon. So I wish you the best of luck with everything. And uh, thanks again for being here. Brett, thank you so much for having me on, man. It was fun. Yeah, for sure. My thanks to Cameron Lowe. Please go check him out on social media, especially all the stuff he's doing business-wise, including Halo Health. The technology sounds awesome. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed hearing about that and what it can do for people dealing with injuries and recovering from surgeries. And, you know, I want to check it out for myself just because, you know, everybody's going through stuff once you hit your mid to late 30s, as some of us have reached now. So uh, getting old sucks. So you, you want to make sure you can heal from those injuries a little quicker. And maybe this new technology with Halo Health can help us do that. So thanks again to Cameron. Great to catch up with him. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. Check out my YouTube page. I drop episodes every Thursday morning, usually around 4 a.m. Pacific time. So check that out. Subscribe, rate, review, leave a comment, like, share, all that stuff with all your friends and, and family who would be interested in listening to a, a fun baseball or sports-related podcast. I'd really appreciate that. And uh, as always, you can find me on Apple and Spotify. So go check out the, the show there. Uh, and if you haven't already hit the five-star rating, that would really help me out. So I really appreciate that. Subscribe, rate, and review there as well. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Pandora, all the places you get your podcast, you can find me there. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. And with that, I will let you go for the day. I appreciate you listening. And as always, I'll see you next time for another great episode. Have a good one.